2011 happened, also known as the Arab Spring. The regime of my country was so corrupt and the people were hungry for change, but the government tried to shut down any dissent at any cost. They were willing to use violence and even kill people if necessary. But we protested, we marched. People lost their fear and the government lost their humanity. In Syria, when you reach 17 or 18, boys were drafted to the army and I couldn't get an exception despite my doctor's efforts. Meanwhile, I was still in school. I had to write my final high school exams. I was getting good marks, but it was really dangerous to cross certain checkpoints to get to school. I took the risk. I couldn't feel that, that I couldn't throw away all of the hard work. Eventually, the war has started. And not that many people were still at my neighborhood. But for my family, my family was still there and running out of food, so my cousin and I decided to start delivering some food into the neighborhood. We got a, a permission signed by the mayor of my city. Men couldn't go out because the army considered everyone as, as a suspect. And as, I, and as I said, they were willing to kill and did. I had papers to go to school, likewise other students. But on that day, I wanted to bring some food into my neighborhood. My cousin and I were arrested at a military checkpoint. The soldiers put bags over our heads and sent us to Air Force Intelligence Center. It's an underground, lawless place. Once you go there, you consider it missing. We thought that's gonna be the end of our lives because how things worked there. They started to beat me and call me a traitor with no reasons. With no reason. And they made me sign a document even. And to this day, I don't know what I signed. And when their leader got, got enough, he told them to send me back to where we belong, meaning to jail. But the guards interpreted this as back to the checkpoint. They misunderstood the order and it ended up saving our lives. Back at the checkpoint, everyone was shocked. How we got back there? On a distance, my father was there, he was crying. And when I hugged him, he was crying so much. I hadn't seen him actually crying since my grandfather passed away. I considered that moment my second birthday, literally. Because I was giving a second chance to live. It was really tough. I just saw my death hours ago, but my dad's tears washed, my dad's tears washed it away. And I felt I was prepared to that moment because 17 years ago from that moment, I was born at the Syrian city of Homs with an eye condition called nystagmus, which means objects are mainly out of focus in my life, in addition to very low vision without being able to define colors, which means also that I'm legally blind. I grew up in a middle-class family my parents were farmers, and I had their support at the house my father built. I didn't really think of myself as different from other kids. Until that moment, the first day of school, it was really tough to deal with. The doctor told my family that I needed a private school, but my family couldn't afford it, so I had to go to our public school. At the time, I was so frustrated, like anyone else would be, in an environment that is inaccessible at all. I had to learn how to adapt by advocating for myself, talking to teacher. It gives me more confidence. And when I communicated my needs, we got closer to a solution. 
we decided on a chair that, that would be a 60 centimeters or less, far away from the chalkboard. I've moved that chair for 12 years of schooling, along, back and forth, the chalkboard. Another reason helped me. Another thing that I used to do was taking my friend's notes so I can copy what I missed and send it back the same day so he can study. And we managed also to stay for 12 years at the same class. So he was my biggest supporter. And he was my note taker. Even officially, we didn't have that concept at the time. Grade five, I asked my father for a computer. And he made it happen. And actually was one of the few computers in the town. It was, was a big deal for me. I bought right away National Geographic on CDs. And it took me on a journey around the world. That was the free adventure. And I also wanted to know how the machine worked itself. And that was what sparked my interest in technology for the first time. And I really knew that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. Started to think about more about the world. At the age of 12, start writing poetry and playing chess. My, my uncle taught me how to play, but actually Gary Kasparov was my great inspiration and still. And I also went a lot to, to the university to watch Shakespeare's work in Arabic. It was such a great experience that time. At the age of 16, I really wanted also to learn more about the world. Started to read ebooks because it worked for me. I could have I could I could zoom in as much as I want. And I wanted actually to read the same book in Arabic first and the second time in English. But the main reason I was able to teach myself Arabic was watching YouTube videos with subtitles and songs with lyrics for almost three years. Which brings me to 2012. That was the biggest moment, biggest decision, when I decided to leave Syria because of the war. I left carrying only my high school diploma and I stayed with some relatives who had already fled and stayed at a refugee camp in Lebanon. It was a new experience. New lifestyle with limited access to the basics of living. And it was hard. But for me, I took it as a short term. I, I thought it's gonna be a short term, an adventure, just have fun, I'm gonna go back soon. But when my family followed me about three months later, Everything changed. We realized that we were refugees. I was trying to find a solution. I was trying to find something to do. My life became so boring. And I couldn't find that solution. But after a while, I started to think about my role in life and what I wanted to do. I saw photographers going to the camp for three or four hours and then leaving. I was inspired. I was there. I lived there. And I knew how it felt to live there. So I wanted to document this. I wanted to document my life at the, at the refugee camp for the future. But the only thing I needed, was missed, is the camera. It was the camera. So I got, I got access into a workshop and I've met a photographer uh, named Brandon Bannon. The workshop was with the United Nations for agency or refugee agency. And he told me, Hani, you have good eye. Keep, keep photographing, keep shooting. Also, I started to help other photographers too. We bartered. So I, do the, I did the translation for them and they let me borrow their equipment. It was such an important life skill to learn that time. 
then really wanted to do more, to engage more. I applied, I was a UNICEF job, and I applied. They wanted a drama teacher to teach or to use psychodrama to help to teach or to teach kids about behavior through a story. I told them I'm not a professional, but I love theater so much, and I can teach basic English as well. So I got the job. They gave it to me. It was five hours a day, five days a week, Sundays off, and about 400 students went through my classes every week. And after school, I also wanted to help the community at the refugee camp, so I started also to help some adults uh, by creating a theater club. I wanted them to use their imagination so we can help ourselves relieve that sadness we were living in. But you know what? I was making some money, but I couldn't really go to that private school close by. Couldn't afford it. So all the money went to support my family. But I'm still, I still missing my education so much, which was taken from me. So I convinced my family to start applying to the resettlement program through United Nations. Then we did, we applied. After a process, interviews, we got, we got a, we asked, we were asked from the Canadian Embassy for an interview. We went there and they were so happy that I could speak English at that time. Later, I got that magical call from the embassy as well, telling me that I was accepted in Canada. I was so thrilled, finally. It's time to go to a place where I can, where I can continue my education. It was a huge, huge challenge. So eventually we were shuttled in Regina, Saskatchewan. It was really challenging. But then I got a sense of the community. Six months later, I was asked, invited to Toronto, and asked to speak about my work. That was with the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression. And I was so happy and thrilled because I realized how valuable my work was at the camp, documenting people's life. And then I got back to Regina with a lot of confidence, really wanted to engage more, to give back to the community that helped me, to my family. So I was asked also to give some presentation to uh, all the units at the RCMP of Regina, or in Regina. It was a great experience because I used my knowledge to inform them about the newcomers, so they can have an idea from a different lens. I was attending ESL at the university there. And in the summer, I wanted also to use the same skill I used with the kids in the camp to share it with newcomer kids. They didn't actually speak each other language, so I wanted to give them a space where they can interact using the language of art. And it was great. At that, the end of that summer, I saw an ad on Facebook about the Prime Minister Youth Council. I hesitated at the beginning, but I opened it. And I saw that it's not really asking about your education level, it's asking about more about your engagement and experience. So I believed in my chances, and I applied. That moment really had a lot of confidence, and I, when I saw an email telling me about there were 16,000 applications, I was shocked and I was like, oh, probably I'm not gonna make it. But in that, I got an email saying, you are, you're selected. I was so happy because that's something I really missed at home, is actually to speak to politicians and to enjoy the free, the free speech that we have here. So I really wanted to help my friends now at the council, and also working with other ministers to shape policies that affect young people, because young people are the future and, 
and the present as well. And also, that's going to affect Canada too. The country who brought me, which brought me here and gave me this, this chance. And I'm so proud of it. My education was still there. When I came to Toronto, summer uh, in December 2016, I really wanted to study here. And this January, I got enrolled into the computer engineering program. That was my dream that was taken away from me. So I'm studying right now at one of the best school here, downtown Toronto. Finally, I made it. And it, is on a, it, it was on a full scholarship and I couldn't ask for more. And now, my life, my life has had painful laws and glorious highs. What I wanted to share with you before I go today is what I believed helped me to push through all the periods of worst adversity. Even though these were human dramas, I realized that home, that every place actually can be home. And every place cannot be home. For me, home now is the people around me and is how I find myself doing the things that feed my soul and mind no matter what the circumstances are. Thank you.